Okay, so welcome everyone. This is our third seminar. Uh, my name is Ray and I'm the chair of the GeoHealth Network. So GeoHealth Network is a student run organization and our aim is to reduce barriers for students to learn health geography skills and network. And we are so thrilled to partner with CANU, the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium. And we've been partnering with CANU to bring you a series of um, seminars about using CANU data to do health geography research. So um, I'm the chair of GeoHealth Network, but we have several execs that founded this organization with me um, who help run this organization. So on the line, we have Dr. Naomi Schwartz, who completed her PhD in the Department of Geography at U of T. Um, Naomi, do you want to give us a wave? <laughs> Naomi's on mute there. Thanks, Naomi. Um, and Megan, who I don't think we have on the line yet, um, but I'll put our links in the chat and you can check out our wonderful, wonderful, hardworking team. And today from Canoe, we have Eleanor. Um, Eleanor, would you like to say a few words to the group? Well, just welcome. Yeah, we're just as happy as Ray and her colleagues are to be uh, partnering on this. I know that uh, the GeoHealth Network is a, a great outreach to a lot of students and we're um, super excited to try and get you guys more into Canoe and using the Canoe data and we're here to help. Yeah, so I will drop, um, and Eleanor, feel free to drop. I have some of your links. Um, we'll put links in the chat for where you can reach both of our organizations. Um, so we've been able to offer you these seminars thanks to very generous donations and support from CANU and from the University of Toronto Department of Geography and Planning, who has been our steadfast uh, support for many years, and from donations from the U of T School of Cities, who has also been um, a big supporter of ours for many years. So today we have Dr. Nicholas Araki Howell. Dr. Howell completed his PhD at the Institute for the Health Pol Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at U of T. He's currently completing his final year of his MD at U of T, Faculty of Medicine. Um, and his research interests are urban environment and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Howell uses large administrative databases to study how features of the urban of urban design and pollution may provoke or prevent conditions like acute myocardial infarction. And we are thrilled to welcome such an exceptional researcher, community leader, and a great friend of mine. And I'm gonna post the paper that we are talking about as well in the chat. So Dr. Howell, uh, you should be able to share your uh, slides. And we'll start recording now. Okay, everyone. Ray, hang well, on. Ray, will you start recording? Yep, it says recording on my end. Oh, perfect. We didn't yep. get any notice. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, one thing I'll say right off the top is that I got a little warning about unstable internet connection. So I've switched over to a better Wi Fi network. Uh, Ray, if for some reason I'm not noticing that I'm cutting out or something, just send me a text uh, and I will try to figure out whatever I can do to solve that issue. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I am going to be talking a little bit about uh, my research and about cardiovascular disease and walkability, neighborhood walkability and air pollution, as well as the ways I've used canoe data um, to help make this study a reality. Um, I'm, I'm going to tailor this talk a little bit to the points that Ray mentioned that would be valuable for this audience. So I'll spend a little bit of talking, time talking about my career path and a little bit of time talking about the data and uh, how this all came together from an administrative point of view. Um, but if I don't hit on the, the points you're looking for, just bring it up in the questions. So here we go. I'm just going to optimize. All right. I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest. Um, one second. I just want to make sure that I'm not blocking my own slides on my end. Apologies. All right. No conflicts, financial professional to declare, um, but I am a cyclist and pedestrian living in downtown Toronto. So that might give me, uh, depending on your point of view, some, some stake in, uh, in these matters. Um, 
In terms of learning objectives, so we'll discuss a theoretical framework for how the Bill's environment can influence cardiovascular disease risk uh, because of this audience. I'm gonna go through that a little more quickly than I would in other settings, uh, but we'll touch on it briefly. And I'm also gonna discuss some prior work looking at associations between the built environment and cardiovascular disease risk before focusing on my particular study, looking at the built environment and air pollution and how they uh, interact to affect risk for diabetes and hypertension. Um, but also a little bit about me. Um, so to talk a little bit about this in my career path, uh, I've been at U of T for a long time, uh, longer than I would have expected when I started out. Um, so I came here in 2007, uh, originally to pursue philosophy and political science, uh, which are still great passions of mine, but uh, not things I'm doing professionally. Um, it wasn't honestly until very late in my undergraduate career around third year that I ever considered that I might be interested in the sciences, uh, in, in medicine or anything like that. Uh, I never took, I didn't take biology in high school or anything like that. Uh, I took chemistry, but that was it. Um, and for a lot of different reasons, I, I had a major career change or, or mindset change at the end of my third year. And uh, I pivoted into psychology, which is what I was interested in at the time. Um, and, uh, and I thought, Leaving undergraduate, I had a notion that I wanted to pursue uh, research further. I'd wanted to pursue healthcare further, um, but I didn't. You know, I, I, it had only been about a year and a half, say, since I had been thinking mostly about being a philosopher or going off to work in policy. So it was a bit of a, a quick adjustment. Um, so I wanted a little bit of extra time to think about that and uh, to explore those career paths. So I ended up pursuing a master's degree uh, through the Institute of Medical Science here at U of T uh, with a focus on neuroscience. Excuse me. In particular, I was working on our relationships uh, between um, or the, uh, the reward related activity of neurons in uh, different regions in the brain. Uh, for those of you who maybe have a neuroscience background, uh, I was looking at the globus pallidus interna and uh, subth uh, subthalamic nucleus, um, which was an interesting experience, but as relevant to this talk, what I can tell you I learned is I learned about research. I learned about how to pull together studies. I learned a little bit about pro uh, primary data collection. And because the, the work we were doing was uh, uh, involving patients, I had a little bit of exposure to clinicians, to surgical environments, and to, and to working with patients, which um, and I'll, and I'm very grateful for that experience. I, I, at, the, at the end of it, I knew that I wasn't going to be a neuroscientist, but it, was, uh, it did lead me to, to think more about healthcare and more about research and where I might like to go in the future. So near the end of that degree, um, on the, with the encouragement of some of my, uh, my supervisors who had also pursued MD-PhDs, uh, I applied to, to medical schools across Canada, um, but ultimately decided to stay um, at the University of Toronto uh, because, you know, I had a lot of support networks here, you know, something I, I probably couldn't have articulated at the time, but what has been very important is to, to have friends and family close by. Uh, and it's a long program, eight years for me. Um, so having that network to get you through things was, uh, was really important. Um, in addition to the, the amazing research opportunities at the University of Toronto. Um, and how I came to be here uh, on this talk and, uh, and by, by extension, my, my research in the built environment and cardiovascular disease um, was a, it was a little bit of a circuitous path. Uh, so I came into the program, I knew I wanted to do research, but even at the time that I was entering, I, I pitched a neuroscience related project. I told them I was gonna be neuro, doing neuroimaging and all sorts of stuff and had people I had already thought about. But even over the course of my first year in, in medical school, the way the program works here is you do your first year of MD at least. I realized that you know neuroscience probably wasn't for me, but I didn't know where I would end up in, in clinically in the future. So I wanted something that would have a really broad set of skills that I could apply to a whole bunch of different disciplines, depending on where I ended up. Um, so that brought me to clinical epidemiology, uh, which is you know it's uh, it's clinical epidemiology because the program intends to recruit uh, clinicians of all kinds. Um, but you can think of it as epidemiology, and my, my research in particular is uh, focused on environmental epidemiology, and that's how I would see it myself professionally. Um, and I was scanning through different people's projects and trying to think about where I'd fit in, and there were definitely a lot of clinical projects as well that were really interesting. Um, but I'd always had an interest in geography, and I'd always had an interest in urban issues, and, um, and I wanted to find a way to you know, potentially explore that. And in coming across different supervisors, I found the person I ended up working with, Dr. Jillian Booth, who was doing just that, who was interested in healthcare. She was interested in uh, diabetes outcomes, uh, cardiovascular disease outcomes, but was really focused on things like um, uh, socio uh, urban socioeconomic status and walkability. 
Uh, so it just sort of seemed like a marriage uh, made in heaven. Like, you know, I would never have expected that to be something that a, a professor would be pursuing in, in that department, but they were. And when I, when I met uh, Dr. Booth, uh, we hit it off right away. So it was a, it was a great sort of, uh, it, it put me at ease in this sort of career path. And every step I've taken since then has been really reassuring and uh, has really encouraged me to, to pursue this and carve my own sort of niche in, uh, in the MD PhD program and as a clinician scientist overall. Um, so as Ray mentioned, I'm, I'm almost done this degree. In fact, uh, I think including this week, I have two weeks left. So <laughs> nearly, nearly done MD, thankfully. And just yesterday, some of you might be aware, but it was the, the match day for, for leaving students in, uh, in Canada. So I can add one more <laughs> line item of U of T to the list. Uh, I'll be staying here for my residency in internal medicine. Um, but I'm also hoping to continue to pursue built environment research and research uh, through the University of Toronto during that time. Um, I wasn't sure if this is the next slide, so I did want to I did want to comment uh, on the background of my interest in geography, and uh, you know I can't attribute this directly, but um, I think a major contributing factor to me having an interest and in thinking about geography were my parents, uh, who met and uh, and fell in love and, and married uh, at the University of Toronto uh, Urban Geography and Physical Geography departments. Uh, it's my dad, my dad Lee on the left, and my mom Diane on the right. Um, so I, I asked them if I could share this and it's iconic photo of Sid Smith, which I think looks more or less the same today as it did when they were at school in the, in the eighties. Um, but yeah, they, you know, they were both people who were really interested in, uh, in urban issues and, uh, I guess, uh, it influenced my, my thinking, uh, throughout, throughout high school and onwards, uh, just to be thinking about these things and passionate about, uh, urban geography. Okay. So now for... A bit of a blast through this uh, this review. What is the built environment? You guys probably could tell me better than myself. Um, so, in terms of a quote from Sal, uh, Salas, um, you sort of encompassing how broad the built environment can be. It's really everything that is built or designed or influenced. Um, things beyond buildings um, that I think most people would think about in the built environment. You know, population density and factors like that but also whole structural layouts of communities, transportation infrastructures, parks and trails, and, th and things that you know, many lay people might think about uh, as, as natural environments, but can be definitely thought about as included in the built environment. So again, how we lay out our towns and cities, uh, our street networks uh, that can make so much of a difference in how we can access places on foot and by cycling versus uh, necessitating car use. Uh, the kinds of main streets we have and the, the mix of different infrastructure, including, uh, including shops and services, but also uh, uh, places to, to live uh, above those shops and services, so that really mixed use development. Uh, gyms and, and physical activity resources, which are a major theme in the literature. And like we talked about transportation infrastructure and parks. Um, and so just to touch briefly again, uh, something that you're probably familiar with, but it's a notion of walkability. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with the concept, it, we're, we're, I'm talking about what a measurement of what uh, supports physical activity in daily life, and in particular transportation physical activity. Sometimes people talk about physical activity as sort of a monolith, but there's different, you know, the different types of activity we engage in, whether it be occupational, recreational, transportation, et cetera. Um, all have different drivers. And so this is where I'm, I'm primarily interested in how neighborhoods can influence transportation activity, going to walk or cycle for errands, to, to commute, to get to work, et cetera. And uh, a lot of the work in the geography literature, frankly, uh, from Severo and colleagues uh, focuses on D variables. So the density of housing and jobs and neighborhoods, destinations within walking distance, diversity of land uses, and the designs of streets and streetscapes. But why would this affect health? Again may not need to convince you, but for some audiences, this, uh, they would need some convincing. So, uh, you know, a cl classic slide of a very busy diagram with all the different factors and how they interact. What I'd like to, do, to draw your attention to is the relationships between physical environments and services, things that we've just been talking about, and their, uh, their effects are, are potentially mediated through, again, perceptions of neighborhoods, perceptions of safety, perceptions of ease of access to these, uh, to these um, these resources, um, and, and additionally, um, also awareness of self-efficacy about being able to engage in physical activity, etc. Those are all mediating factors between the environment on one hand and our actual behavior on the other. Um, but presuming that you can have a walkable neighborhood enough to, to sort of change your perceptions about what you'd like to do, your ability to engage in physical activity in daily life, 
that can potentially in, uh, introduce behavior change uh, and that hopefully that, uh, that increase in physical activity that you engage in day to day can also affect uh, health outcomes uh, such as cardiometabolic health outcomes. Now, of course, there's a lot of other things in the slide and I think the literature has a, a lot of opportunities to explore how, how these things, these different mediators can interact these other, and other, uh, other neighborhood factors that are beyond the built environment. Um, so for, uh, for, uh, for, for, for example, uh, social integration, social interactions, social supports, how these things are also mediators of the relationship between the built environment and health outcomes that maybe haven't been explored as much in some of the work. So then there's a question of whether, okay, maybe walkability can affect your perception. Maybe it gets you doing a little bit more activity, but is this really meaningful in terms of health outcomes? Uh, Cause that's ultimately what we would care about at least in the health geography and health, res uh, and health research. So, you know, many papers that are becoming probably classics at this point, uh, one by Salas and Lancet in 2016, finding that in, uh, in neighborhood, in uh, cities, comparing the, uh, some of the highest and lowest uh, walkability, uh, walkable areas, finding that individuals can uh, get up to 89 minutes of moderate to vis uh, vigorous physical activity is the difference between those areas. So potential gain for some individuals of 89 minutes per week, uh, which is a lot, you know, the, the guidelines generally suggest about 150 minutes overall. So that's roughly 59% of, uh, of your weekly physical activity, just, uh, just due to this difference in, uh, in built environment. And I know that's uh, it's pretty significant. And of course, there's different ways you can cut and slice this. Um, but even I would say these other estimates, uh, to just uh, contrasting slightly differently, accounting for 33, about 33% of your total physical activity um, guidelines for the week. Um, that's, that's very significant. If I could get uh, people that we see in clinic to, to increase their phys moderate to vigorous physical activity by nearly 50 minutes every week, um, I think we'd be in pretty good shape um, for a lot of people's uh, preventative health. Um, so these are, these are tangible benefits that would have a clinically meaningful impact. And we see this, that was an international study, but we see this uh, as well in Canada. This was a study by Thielman and colleagues in 2016 uh, using uh, data from the Canadian Health Measures Study, uh, looking at differences in, in uh, vigorous physical activity across different quintiles of physical activity and finding that uh, for most groups, except for the very youngest who may have different drivers of physical activity in their neighborhoods, uh, we're seeing again, close to 70% of your guidelines in terms of the differences between the highest and lowest quintiles. So significant amount of physical activity we're talking about. Um, further study, this one from, from our group, Creatore and colleagues in 2016, again, finding that in the most walkable neighborhoods, we're seeing more walking and cycling and far more, and it's definitely clinically significant versus uh, those that are less walkable. Um, but importantly, we also see this uh, trend, uh, also this trend follow for intermediate health come, outcomes. So things like obesity and overweight, uh, having a lower prevalence in the most walkable neighborhoods compared to those that are less, less walkable. Um, you know, these, are, these are differences that are approaching in some cases 10% differences in prevalences, which are, are striking. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, you know, most clinical interventions wouldn't have the same necessarily level of efficacy for things like obesity and overweight. Um, or in, in some cases, things like diabetes. Uh, which are uh, you know, an important health outcome in and of themselves, uh, as opposed, and in addition to the, them being risk factors for other health outcomes like, uh, like vision loss and cardiovascular disease. And again, we're seeing in some cases differences that are approaching over 1% uh, or um, a difference in incidence of uh, one person per thousand, which is again, pretty striking. Same thing for hypertension, study from, uh, by Maria Chu and colleagues. And some of our own work, uh, which has also found differences in systolic blood pressure um, between the most and the least walkable neighborhoods. Um, so again, highlighting that those in the least walkable neighborhoods have uh, increased blood pressure I, uh, and uh, lower levels of HDL cholesterol, which is, uh, you know, in, in scare quotes, the, the good cholesterol, so to speak. So overall, it seems that we can take that the built environment could have a meaningful impact on uh, cardiovascular health. Um, but there's been little, there's been relatively little look, work looking at uh, contextual interactions between the built environment. And this is true of a lot of epidemiology where people will look at one exposure and one outcome and we'll talk about the relationship between those two things. And that's very important, but obviously, and especially in environmental epidemiology, it's clear that there's multiple environmental factors that commingle and coexist and could potentially uh, mutually influence the effect of each other. We, I, my, uh, having reviewed some of the past talks in the series, I know we've talked, uh, there's been, been work looking at interactions and, uh, and the correlations between some of these shared environmental exposures. 
So in particular in the study I'll talk about today, uh, in relating to tra traffic related air pollution. So we know that there's associations between higher walkability and higher air pollution. Um, so you can, you, know, you can think about this as being dense urban areas, having more, more cars, more congestion, things like this. And air pollution is, an, is a risk factor for cardio cardiovascular disease. Um, so is it possible that by uh, having built environments that encourage people to walk, but potentially walk in polluted environments, might, be, might we be losing the benefit or even increasing people's risk uh, by increasing their exposure to air pollutants? And uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, notable studies in this area, including by Marshall and looking at Vancouver in 2009, uh, 2009 looking at correlations between areas that are on the left uh, highly polluted and on the right uh, have a higher, uh, uh, higher walkability and there's a, an overlap to a good extent here, at least for, um, for NO2, uh, one, one species of traffic related air pollutant. And this is just to say that similarly, when you look at PM 2.5, areas that are more walkable um, by various dimensions also have a higher, uh, higher concentration of uh, particulate matter air pollution. So that finally brings us to the question that I wanted to address in the study uh, and to look in particular at the relationships and interactions between uh, walkability on one hand, which is supposed to have a beneficial association with cardiovascular disease risk factors and traffic related air pollution on the other hand. Uh, which is a deleterious effect and how they come together. Does, does air pollution negate some of the benefit of walkability or vice versa? So to answer this question, uh, we looked at data uh, that was drawn from 15 different urban centers in Southern Ontario. We focused on 2008, which is where primarily where we had data from. And the data sources were all health administrative databases that are held at ICES. And uh, the cohort in particular that uh, I can talk about more in the questions if you're interested is called the Canhart cohort. So what that is, is sort of a, a pulling together of a lot of different databases to form a cohort of individuals who did not have cardiovascular disease at baseline um, and having a deep level of information on their clinical outcomes. So uh, any visits to the hospital, uh, in particular uh, hospital visits involving a admission to hospital, what the diagnoses were, what kind of procedures were done, did they need things like revascularization? Uh, so for people with uh, an acute myocardial infarction, like a heart attack, Oftentimes as individuals will get something called percutaneous coronary intervention uh, to help uh, save that individual. So those, those interventions are all recorded versus uh, medications that are distributed. And as well, we have a host of uh, laboratory tests. So thankfully um, there's been a lot of work done recently helping integrate the uh, helping integrate um, lab, lab testing data in, from hospitals, but also outside of hospitals um, that allow us to have a better sense for um, uh, for individuals' risk factors like uh, cholesterol, et cetera. Um, so this is essentially like a clearinghouse, pulling all this information together that we can use to build cohorts and, uh, and test associations. Um, so the design was cross-sectional. So we focused on January 1st, 2008 in particular. And the outcomes we were interested in were hypertension and diabetes. And again, these were administratively defined. So uh, uh, to talk a little bit about it, uh, diabetes was defined using the Ontario Diabetes Database. Um, so it uses a um, individual's billing codes. So when, they, when you visit uh, a physician, whether in the outpatient setting or an inpatient setting, that physician in order to get reimbursed uh, and paid for the, the services they deliver has to describe to the Ministry of Health a little bit about the conditions that brought that individual there. And so by using, uh, by using uh, billings that are related to individual's healthcare visits, we can get a sense for if an individual might have diabetes, say, because a physician billed for a diabetes related code, uh, you know, say twice in one year. Um, and that gives you an idea that, okay, this person probably has diabetes or, or if they were admitted to hospital with a diagnosis of diabetes, um, then that would be a, a very strong indication that that person does have something like that. And in the validations that are done comparing, you know, the, the, the coding schemes of who we would think has diabetes based on our algorithms and uh, who actually has uh, evident or has notations of diabetes in their original charts and having diabetes, whether it be type one or type two, uh, we find that the sensitivity and specificity are pretty excellent um, uh, with specificity up to 98%. And similarly for hypertension, the sensitivity is a little bit lower, uh, but great specificity. Um, in, in terms of the looking how we looked at the association between these, our exposures, as I mentioned, were walkability and traffic related air pollution. And we looked at their association with diabetes and hypertension based on a logistic progression uh, and looking at an interaction term between those two exposures. And in terms of modeling, we chose to use a, something called a generalized estimating equations approach. So this, this accounts for uh, people being clustered in different neighborhoods. There's a, there's a correlation in outcomes between individuals who share some, some feature in common, like a neighborhood. Um, commonly, uh, people might use something called uh, 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 multi-level modeling to address this or other uh, random effects models, but uh, I, 
I, my personal preference is to use GEs for uh, for some other reasons. But both of those methods, both of those methods address uh, clustering of individuals, which is really important in this area of research. So how we looked at walkability. This was uh, a measure that was developed by my supervisor, Dr. Booth, uh, who drew information from the census, looking at population and dwelling densities from DMTI databases, uh, which are registries of businesses across Canada. Um, that gives us an, an idea of how many, uh, how many um, services are available within a certain distance of, uh, of a neighborhood. And neighborhoods were, were taken to be uh, dissemination areas for the purposes of this study, uh, which are units of uh, census geography. There are obvious limitations and pros and cons to that, but that's the approach they took. And as well, the number of, uh, the number of the street connectivity in the neighborhoods, so looking at how many three-way and four-way intersections are, again, within uh, 800 meters of a centroid of a, of a dissemination area. To get a sense, when we pull that all together, when we normalize each of those variables and pull them all together, which in neighborhoods are more walkable and which uh, might be less walkable. Uh, and now where Canoe comes in is our looking at uh, traffic-related air pollution. So um, there's, for those of you who haven't done, you know, looked uh, at Canoe yet and uh, the different uh, uh, exposures that are available, there's tons of information there uh, with respect to air pollution databases. So I know for a fact that they have information on uh, PM 2.5, I believe that they have ozone as well. And finally, they have uh, both national level and uh, regional level models of uh, NO2. So traffic-related air pollution, uh, to take a step back and explain why we're looking at NO2, um, it's you know, in theory, to get a sense for uh, how much exposure you have to traffic related air pollution, you'd have a micro level um, assessment of each individual. Um, so you might have an assessment of, um, you know, using things like a wristband or tracking them over time in different neighborhoods they spend time in, uh, or even a sampling uh, device that would sample the air around you. Levels of different pollutants um, that are related to, to traffic and combustion engines. Um, but for our purpose, we focus on a surrogate pollutant, so one pollutant that's meant to represent the whole, as opposed to being interested in NO2 in particular. Um, and we we create uh, or and other individuals who I to whom I own very much create uh, things called land use regression models, uh, which are, are regression models that can predict for different levels of geography um, what the value of NO2 would be at that site based on different information. So things like land use. Um, how much is open land use, industrial sites, um, whether you're near a major road or, or highway, meteorological information, uh, including uh, precipitation patterns, et cetera, and satellite imaging, um, which depending on the model you're using, uh, can use things for like for PM 2.5, often we'll use uh, uh, variables like uh, aerosol optical depth, which are, are in a way uh, predictors of, of PM 2.5 levels, but all to say, uh, for, for this measure, uh, using Environment Canada's National Air Pollution Surveillance Network and CANOE, uh, where this data is held, um, uh, they use a variety of land use, meteorological, and satellite imaging predictors to predict ground level NO2 at, uh, at, uh, for the, our individuals' neighborhoods uh, at, in 2006. And when they did validation, uh, Perry Heistead had developed these models, and when he did the uh, validation of them, they have a, show a very high level of, uh, of um, uh, performance. Um, for actual measured levels of NO2. So with R squared of about uh, 0.73, which is, a, which is pretty good. Okay, so what is, that, what is uh, walkability and NO2 look like in, in Canada? So, or at least in these, in these areas. So we can see here, these are uh, maps of Toronto. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, although I have interactions with health geography and I love to learn about mapping, uh, I'm probably not the most skilled mapper you'll meet. And that's definitely not where my major skill set lies. So apologies for some of these maps. Um, but we can see here on the, on the left that um, what you might expect. So the areas of Toronto that are most walkable are those that are downtown, a lot of the older parts of the city. And as you get further and further away, uh, with some exceptions, walkability tends to decrease. Um, so areas that are, more, are maybe older suburbs, et cetera. Um, and in contrast, we can see that for PM 2.5, the areas that are lowest in terms of air pollution are, are largely off uh, near the beaches or Scarborough for closer to the lake and, uh, and more um, that maybe have more uh, of a, a clearing effect of, of the, uh, uh, from being so close to the lake. Whereas areas that are say near the 401 up north have higher level, uh, levels of air pollution. Uh, areas that are close to the Gardner in the south are, have a higher levels of air pollution and uh, sort of middling levels of air pollution as well, um, you know, in other areas of the cities that are, that are uh, more urbanized. And then Ottawa, which I picked because I'm originally from Ottawa um, and have a, a personal affinity there, similar patterns, although obviously uh, different levels of walkability and, and air pollution overall. So 
walkable, uh, walkable areas in Ottawa, highly concentrated downtown. Um, and similarly, where, where most uh, the highest concentrations of traffic related air pollution are, although across the board, lower levels of pollution in, in Ottawa. Okay, so when we look at the associations between uh, walkability and traffic related air pollution and both these cardiometabolic outcomes, hypertension and diabetes, we find that before we look at any interactions, the, the straight associations are what you'd imagine. So um, walkability being on a low, le uh, low level of walkability compared to a high level of walkability uh, uh, is associated with increased odds of having both hypertension and diabetes, something in the order of you know, 30, 34% increased odds for hypertension, 25% increased odds for, uh, for diabetes. And similarly for traffic related air pollution, areas that have uh, higher levels of traffic related air pollution have uh, higher, higher odds of um, of having hypertension and diabetes. So sort of like we'd expect. And I, I breezed over this a little bit during the, uh, the discussion, um, but with this controls for age, sex, ethnicity, immigration history, and neighborhood income as ways to, uh, to control for some amount of confounding. Although ultimately um, these are still uh, associational studies. But what we're really interested in is, is the interaction effect. So what, how does the, the likelihood of having hypertension or diabetes change, not just depending on walkability and NO2 considered in isolation, um, but when you actually inter, uh, have an interaction and look at their effect together. So the, there's an, a significant interaction. And when we actually try to plot it to give you an idea, like, what, what does this mean? We find that, okay, in areas that have a low level of NO2, um, so this would be, you know, um, I believe if I'm remembering correctly, in the order of zero parts per billion to about five parts per billion or 10 parts per billion. Um, you can refer to the paper for the precise, uh, precise uh, numbers. Um, things behave as, as we would expect them to. So areas that uh, have high level walkability, you have a lower likelihood of having hypertension. And as walkability decreases in these low pollution areas, uh, the likelihood of, of having hypertension increases. So this is sort of like the standard walkability story. Walkability associated with better, a high walkability associated with better cardiometabolic outcomes. But we can see as air pollution levels increase, that same relationship is lost. And, and effectively at the highest levels of pollution, and again, I'll have to, I believe this is around 40 parts per billion to 50 parts per billion. Uh, I should have included that in these figures, uh, but refer to the paper for the full information. Um, values that were high by uh, uh, certainly within our study, but are, are observed that these, these levels of pollution exist in neighborhoods in, in our study areas. Um, we really don't see any, any difference in the levels of hypertension across different uh, levels of walkability. So individuals in the most walkable and the least walkable areas have comparable uh, risks. Um, it doesn't seem to be any benefit. Um, so in, in summary, there does seem to be an interaction between pollution and walkability such that um, pollution take air, traffic related air pollution takes away some of that benefit of walk, neighborhood walkability that you would normally expect to see. Um, and the similar things were observed for diabetes. So finding that uh, in areas with, again, oh, sorry, I thought I had a figure or a little, uh, uh, an arrow, in areas of low, walk, uh, low pollution, so in the far right set of uh, bar graphs, um, the relation in high walkability neighborhoods, less risk of diabetes or odds of diabetes versus those in less walkable neighborhoods, and that protective association is lost as soon as you get to um, highly polluted areas. So, what does that mean? Well, I mean, this sort of highlights, I've, I've said some of these summary, summary statements before and, and describing the graphs, but it means that you have to see, you have to see these two exposures uh, in relationship to each other and not in isolation. A lot of different studies um, will look at these independently and you know, I'm, I'm guilty of this too. Some of my works uh, look only at the associations between walkability and say cardiovascular disease risk factors or, or physical activity. Um, but I think there's a greater appreciation now uh, over time for the interplay between these different variables and how they might be related. And this, this study would suggest, although certainly this is an unsettled area of, uh, of the literature, that you know, we do need to take in, into account uh, multiple exposures at the same time to see whether or not uh, who, who benefits, what kinds of neighborhoods show benefits. And this can also give you an idea uh, when you, you know, someday you're making policy proposals, um, you want to have a policy proposal that will encapsulate all the different factors that can affect cardiovascular health, cardiometabolic health um, together, and not just think in isolation, because you might imagine making a proposal, you know, we should have more density, we should have more, you know, uh, more street network connectivity, etc. But you might just end up producing new neighborhoods that are highly walkable, yes, but maybe have uh, are, are 
or have a lot of congestion and a lot of other sources of traffic related air pollution, in which case you're missing some of the benefit that you could be accruing if you took into, a into account other factors. And I wouldn't be surprised, I haven't done this work myself, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the same things apply for you know, green space, blue space, all sorts of, and other, other pollutants as well. Um, and so I think I would encourage those, uh, those of you who are listening and who are interested in this area of research to really take that up and, and look at these interactions and try and tell more complex stories um, because there's definitely more, more things out there and it'll help as we engage in this area of literature, it'll help us articulate a better vision for what are heart healthy communities and what can we be doing to really look after health at the population level. So in terms of limitations, I know I'm coming up close to time for questions, so I'll move quickly through this. Um, Cross-sectional design. So this is, we would, ideally we would do this in a cohort study. Um, so we're, we can't, so uh, there's not necessarily a temporal ordering between the exposures we're looking at and people's health outcomes. Um, you know, I don't necessarily suspect that people would move, based on their health status, would move to areas that are more or less walkable or more polluted, but it limits our ability to make causal inferences definitely. We also can adjust for self-selection. So this is a huge problem in the area of walkability research. Uh, people choose to live in neighborhoods for different reasons. They're not usually related to their health, but they might be related to things like um, their family situation, how many individuals live with them, or do they have dependents, do they need a car for work, et cetera. And so, or versus are they people who really value being able to walk to work or, or to cycle to work? Um, and so, you know, some studies have information on self-selection and, and neighborhood preferences and can adjust for that. But for many studies, including this one, we can't. So there might be some confounding effect here as well. And then of course, there are a variety of other confounders and residual confounding for measured confounders that, uh, that we have to contend with. But strengths are that there's a large population-based uh, sample from multiple regions. We get a lot of compare and contrast a lot of different cities, not just one city in particular. And we use validated measures of several key variables. So, in terms of overall implications for the literature, you know, encouraging development of walkable neighborhoods can promote physical activity and improve cardiovascular health, but we should be having a more nuanced thoughts of how to, how to facilitate these links and how to ameliorate air pollution in walkable areas, whether that be through things like encouraging, uh, you know, encouraging active, active transportation um, and different, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not someone who is, uh, is, is drafting policy regularly, so I don't know how radical these ideas are, how likely to be implemented, but in terms of things like congestion taxes and other things, these could very well be uh, factors that might help ameliorate pollution in walkable neighborhoods. So in terms of summary, this is the things we mentioned. I think we can, uh, we can move on to, to questions after acknowledging all the supports and the many supporters that I've had in pulling together some of this work. So, Jillian Booth, my supervisor, as well as my committee, Jack, uh, Dr. Jack Tu, um, uh, Raheem Moynihan and Robert Fowler, and collaborators, like I mentioned, Dr. Perry Heistad, uh, who I believe is in Oregon now, um, Oregon State University, and Dr. Hong Chen, uh, who's now at uh, Health Canada, I believe, um, and uh, Anna Chu at ICS, helping them pull this all together, and uh, individuals from the geography department, Dr. Widener, Dr. Farber, and uh, the Center for Urban Health Solutions, and of course, the, the funders of this research, the IHR, uh, the Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarship that I had during the time this work was completed and CANU for providing data and as well funding support to attend conferences for the dissemination of this information. So with that, I'll leave it open for questions. And uh, that's my email, happy to answer any email, uh, any, any questions you have uh, at a later date, um, whether it be about research, whether it be about career planning, anything you like. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at Nicholas A. Howell. And with that, I think I'll pass it back to Ray. Great, thank you so much. Um, excellent presentation and uh, excellent research. Um, so we have the Q&A, which you can use. And then you can also, um, I believe you can raise your hand or you can put in the chat if you'd like to come off mute or even go on video to ask your question. We certainly, welcome that but otherwise I'll read off the questions in the Q&A or um, yeah and I forgot to mention I've been putting in the chat that we do have a lottery for students um, for a hundred dollars cash just for being here today because we know how valuable your time is and we feel like you should get paid to learn so I'm going to put the link in the chat again and um, just fill out that form anytime uh, today tomorrow or the next day and uh, we're gonna randomly draw one winner to win $100, thanks to our donors. 
So um, I'll look for hands or anyone who wants to come off mute or video can get priority. Um, otherwise, I will go to the chat. So Anna asks, um, are these minutes performed as leisure activity or something else like other tasks needed to be completed like grocery shopping or going to work? So when you're measuring activity, does maybe that's the type of activity that's uh, being captured? So I'm just going to go back here. Um, so I think that this question, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, refers to these sorts of studies. So looking at um, physical activity uh, by Salas and colleagues or in, in Thielman in Canada. And here I can speak to Thielman because I remember the details fairly well. Um, the, the advantage of this study was that it looked at moderate to vigorous physical activity and it looked at it using accelerometry data. So more objective evidence of activity than just uh, surveying people and asking them how much activity they engage in. But the, uh, the uh, in contrast, the, the downside is that, you know, you can't, uh, or at least I don't think they did, uh, separate out what kind of physical activity. So like going back to that point I made earlier, this would encompass total physical activity. So occupational, um, transportation, recreational. And so, excuse me, there's a lot of nuance in there that, uh, that would be important. It's, it's an important study regardless because it can show that especially on the overall level, uh, you know, at the end of the day, how much physical activity you get period, um, there's an association and a, and a protective association uh, or at least a, help, a, a salutary association between walkability and health. Um, but I think further studies are needed to to pull apart and tease apart what is the relationship between physical activity um, and, and walkability in the objective way. Using, um, using survey data, there's already been studies that have teased things apart and they can find that the, the studies that tend to show the most consistent and strong relationships between walkability and activity are transportation physical activity. Recreational activity seems to be different, which makes sense. You know, the places you wanna to walk to for recreation are likely different. You might drive somewhere to go to a park. You might drive somewhere to go to you know, um, a soccer pitch or something. Um, so there's, there's a whole different psychology and, uh, and built environment sort of uh, reality that to contend with there. Um, uh, but unfortunately we, for those studies, it's usually survey data and, uh, and self-report data because it is so hard to tease apart um, uh, accelerometry data based on uh, individuals' intentions. Yeah, and the, um, the GPS data is just seems to be difficult to parse uh, mathematically too. I think there's lots of groups who are trying to tease out travel mode based on that and not having a huge amount of, of clear success yet. I, I salute all the people who, who do the hard work trying to tease that apart. I, I have just witnessed people. I've never tried to myself. I remember, but someone, a colleague of mine was trying to do that and it just looked like um, too big brain for me. Too, too yeah. <laughs> It's ha people are working on that though. So if you are interested in that, there's that's certainly something that I see a lot of labs looking to take on students for. So um, Abby asks, do you have a sense of whether traffic related air pollution can influence walking behaviors, not just their interplay on hypertension risk? Do you think that would influence your conclusions? That's, that's such a great question. Um, you know, I think that there's definitely work out there looking at how, you know, how pollution or at least uh, like traffic uh, density and things like that, because it, you know, all, I think some of us have an idea about where pollution is based on like exhaust coming to tailpipes and you know, the, how, how fresh the air seems. Um, but I don't know how, you know, how good we are detecting say like with a real level of uh, uh, sophistication uh, because we can't see it of course. Um, but we do have some notions about where it might be more polluted. And there is some work that I believe shows that people do uh, um, in some cases route their routes to avoid high traffic areas or areas that might be higher in pollution, at least when they are walking or cycling. Um, but I don't know how that fully, I, you know, I, I have to admit, I don't know fully how that it, uh, it would place in here. It might mean that the, it changes the confounding structure. So individuals who are still taking those, those uh, high, uh, highly polluted, those traffic through those highly polluted areas may not have other choices. Um, but at this point, you know, for my part, it would be speculation. So I think that's an area of the literature that needs to, needs to develop and I also need to do a digger uh, to dig deeper as well um, because I see some of those those papers come out and uh, but I haven't uh, I'm not as, as familiar with all that literature um, but if you're interested I think that some of the 
Uh, I know Marianne Hats Hatsipalu in uh, U of T, I believe, does look at this a little bit, or at least in collaboration with other individuals. And I think that some of the people look at it most closely with cycling. I've seen most papers look at cycling routes and things like that, and cycling exposure to air pollution as opposed to pedestrian traffic. But um, and if you're interested in specific, specific papers, you can message me um, at my email. I'll try to find some for you. Um, but that's about as much as I can give you off the top of my head. Yeah, there are a lot of cycling papers. I did my master's in that field, and they were they were attaching sensors to cyclists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Um, and we do have, I'll just um, mention and I'll put in the chat, our, our next seminar um, next month is also about um, air pollution and mortality. So you can come back next month and we'll keep talking about this theme. So another question from Anna, can you comment on how to compensate for the parts of the city where interaction of high pollution walkability that exist in reality. What can we do for the people living there to promote their health aside from telling them to move out? So what do we do for people who live in these areas that where there's high high pollution? You know, I think that there's this, you can think of different levels of, uh, of advice you might give. So the individual, like if this is someone you were seeing on a one-to-one -one basis, you know, it, it's challenging. You know, I don't know if I would recommend wearing a mask. Uh, I don't know if I'd recommend wearing an N95 um, to try and to address some of these things. So, and depending on, you know, I know NO2 is a surrogate pollutant, but you know, some of these pollutants are aerosols and so wouldn't be covered by masks anyway. I think the most sensible advice you can give is to try and engage in physical activity a little bit further away. So the nice, nice thing about NO2 is that again, and with the acknowledgement that it's a surrogate is that levels tend to drop off fairly quickly. So within, I believe 50 meters, you already start to see a dip in the concentration and the further away you get, the, the, the further the concentration drops. Um, now it's a little more complicated because there's effects of being downwind and all sorts of things like that. Um, but if I was to speak to someone individually, I'd say like, you know, try to find areas of the neighborhood or adjacent neighborhoods, et cetera, where there's a little bit less traffic, you're a little bit further away from the major arterial roads, highways, et cetera, um, to do physical activity. Like don't, don't, be, don't be too frightened of physical activity that you don't engage in it because that's not good either um, or, or that sort of thing, but try to, to risk mitigate where you can. So that's what I would say to the individual. Um, and that's sort of in line a little bit with uh, recommendations we already give to individuals, say with COPD or heart failure, um, when the air quality index is, is, is very high or, or a very poor air quality. There are recommendations that individuals with certain comorbidities may avoid going outside if not necessary or, or avoid engaging in physical activity. So if you're interested, you might look at some of that uh, messaging, um, but I think we can extend that in this case. Um, and I will also say like, I think this is a sort of an unsettled area of research. I don't wanna say like, Based on my study only, you should change your activity pattern. Like I, again, do engage in physical activity. Don't be scared of physical activity. Um, but if you can, this would be one way to mitigate. I think a bigger conversation is about, you know, what can we do on the level of policy? Like how do we get, you know, how do we get these neighborhoods to have lower levels of pollution to begin with? Uh, it's complicated. Um, you know, some interesting work shows that, you know, even though the levels of air pollution in these neighborhoods are higher, it's generally not, as you might imagine, the people residing in those neighborhoods that are generating that pollution is through traffic. It's people from other neighborhoods that are driving to downtown areas for work, for school, et cetera, that are generating that traffic-related air pollution. And in fact, individuals in dense urban areas generate far less uh, traffic-related air pollution, among other things than you'd imagine. So, you know, I, I don't pretend to be a geographer and I'm sure many of these ideas have uh, large histories that, that are beyond my scope, but things like changing how, how we concentrate industry and jobs in one areas that would necessitate um, a large amount of travel to one area where there might be more congestion. How can you decentralize some of these things? How can you support uh, transportation infrastructure that can allow for mass transit to bring people in? Uh, so there's less pollution per person, less congestion per person, more efficiency in that way. Um, you know, these are big, big challenges uh, to get people to use transportation, public transportation, to get them to use it efficiently, um, and to get uh, and to get. Uh, development in regional centers more, more equitably across areas as opposed to like a megapolis that has a lot of concentration in one area. Um, yeah, uh, those are important issues going forward. Um, and I look forward to the individuals who will be able to, uh, to address them. But those are some ideas. Yeah, and maybe even too for these, you know, very urban neighborhoods, um, taking a look at just their use of primary care and, and how do we get people to the family doctor more because you know, there's just this spatial mismatch happening of, um, 
low primary care use and then you know high morbidity and mortality of these very downstream severe um, health issues right so mm -hmm. maybe so I think there's lots that could be done. So we have time for one more question from Jeremy. Are you excited to see how electric vehicles will change the effect modification due to pollution over time? In other words, if people stop driving vehicles that pollute these areas, do you expect that the overall effect of walkability will appear to increase because the walkability health effect will no longer be attenuated by pollution? I mean, I'm absolutely excited, and you know, based on based on the work that we have here, you know, we would expect that that would be how things would go. So, as as cars, if they don't pollute, um, you know, there wouldn't be the same level of uh, deleterious effects from exercising and increasing your ventilation in polluted areas. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think that's how things would shake out. Of course, you know, famous last words in observational research, you need to really uh, you need to do those studies and see and track over time how the effects uh, how these effects shake out. Um, but I think that that's right. I think that we would see an enhanced effect of walkability. Um, and I am excited. You know, I'm, I'd be more excited if we can get to a place where, you know, people are walking and cycling more for, uh, for transportation, but I acknowledge that that's not a reality for everyone. Um, so the availability of, of uh, electric cars uh, and, and broadly uh, available to individuals uh, so that all individuals could access these sorts of things uh, would, be, would be one helpful strategy and would be uh, something I would expect to improve health outcomes, at least in, in this specific area. Yeah, and maybe just um, our, our public transit vehicles also uh, moving to electric too, right? Just um, like we talk a lot about like individual changes, but I think seeing the changes that that the city can make and anything that's aggregate aggregate changes for like that on the population level, I think um, would be useful to start talking about. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Howell. You're very clearly in between an extremely busy day. So thank you for all your hard work. Um, we're thinking of you working in the hospital right now and we appreciate you taking the time to share this with us. Um, and yeah, we're very inspired. And I'm gonna put up, um, we have, um, our next session is next month on May 21st, and we're going to be talking about greenness, air quality, and mortality. So uh, be sure to register. This is our final and fourth uh, seminar in this series with this excellent collab we've been able to do with Canoe. So yeah, thanks for hanging out with us today. Make sure that you um, Put your name in for the lottery and register for this next session. And Dr. Howell very generously shared his email. So um, feel free to get in touch with him if you have questions about what he's working on. And yeah, we hope everyone has a really great day and we'll see you all soon. Thanks guys. Really great to, have, uh, to be here. Bye everyone. Let me see here.